It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to American Forum. Our country has been embroiled in an impassioned national debate over the past two years, driven by what has appeared to be a surge of questionable killings of African-American citizens by police in Ferguson, Missouri, New York City, Baltimore, St. Louis, North Charleston, South Carolina, Chicago, and on and on. The arguments have been very sharp about what to do and how to fix things. But there has been wide agreement across the political spectrum about what the problems are that the United States imprisons too many people for too long, that punishment appears to be unfair, particularly to black citizens, that the system has become too draconian and too expensive. In the months ahead, as Americans decide among presidential contenders and then choose our next national leader, these issues will often be at center stage. Among citizens who are most impassioned about what is often called mass incarceration, the conventional wisdom is that the entire issue is fundamentally about race about laws designed to be unfair to minority groups, about racist police officers abusing African Americans. Our guest today has written one of the most insightful and important new books related to this controversy, and one which compels us to reconsider some of those fundamental assumptions about what is happening in America. Adam Benferrado is a Harvard Law graduate, a law professor at Drexel University, and the author of Unfair, The New Science of Criminal Injustice, which may be one of the most important books written in a very long time. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Well, I want to start right off with why I wanted you to come on the show. Um, and that is that I referred to it a second ago in the introduction that we've had this huge debate about mass incarceration. And it seems to be overwhelmingly uh, about race and a vestige of the past discrimination uh, in, of the United States, these historical patterns, the mistreatment of African Americans. But I've had a problem with that narrative, even though I fundamentally agree with it. Um, but I have been complicated by the fact that in Atlanta, for instance, the young African-American man who goes to prison for an overly long sentence uh, for an offense that doesn't seem to merit that, there's a relatively high probability that he was arrested by a black police officer, prosecuted by a black lawyer, sentenced to that long term by an African-American judge. And so there is this complication. Is this just about race, or is it, are, are there other things at work? Sometimes the answer to that is institutional issues, or that the, law, the way the laws themselves work. But your book opens us up to a, a set of additional possibilities. It doesn't blank those out, but it offers some other explanations for that. But so tell us what they are. So I'm really interested in the hidden forces that shape the behavior of detectives and judges and jurors and witnesses and others in our criminal justice system. And so in each chapter, I look at a different one of these characters and I contrast the conventional stories that we tell about how these people make decisions and where things can go wrong with what the latest evidence from psychology and neuroscience has to say. So I think, you know, you ask the question, is this all just about race? And the answer is no, it's not just about race. There's a whole bunch of other stuff going on. And the stories that we tell about how race comes in and causes problems in the criminal justice system um, are limited. They're not the total story. So I think the conventional stories that we tell about um, racial injustice is that our police forces are still filled with bigots, right? The real problem is racial animus among judges and jurors and witnesses. Um, and I don't think that, that is the case. So in writing this book, um, I did ride-alongs with police officers, I met with lawyers, and I looked at the science about um, discrimination. And what that science says is that racial animus is probably not the big problem that we face. Rather, the problem is endemic stereotypes, damaging stereotypes that we've all been exposed to by watching television, by reading books over a period of decades, and which link concepts like violence or crime with blackness. And so these implicit forces then shape real world behavior, things that have very serious consequences for minorities. Say interactions with a police officer, 
Now what the research suggests is these implicit stereotypes, um, these attitudes that are racialized um, can impact things like how quickly someone goes to their gun, um, whether someone sees an ambiguous object in someone's hand as a cell phone or as a weapon. And so I think that that's probably why we're seeing um, the disparate impacts that we do across the legal system. Are there still some um, explicitly bigoted people in our police departments? Yes, but if we got rid of every one of those people, we'd still have racially disparate impacts and we need to face up to, I think, the true causes of that injustice. Are these sorts of incidents happening at a greater frequency or is it just that we now can see them more plainly? So I actually think that they're probably happening less than they have in the past. Um, I think that uh, what's different is that we're finally starting to pay attention. Part of that has to do with emerging technologies. Everyone has a cell phone now, and whenever they see a problem, they tend to do it. And um, videotapes, which once were turned over to you know, a prosecutor and disappeared, now are uploaded, uh, you know, put on Twitter, and go viral. And so I think that's what's changed. I think we always had deep unfairness. I think we always had wrongful convictions. We just didn't know about it. Um, I think the other reason that we now know more is that uh, science is showing us that these things happen across our criminal justice system. What's well, actually a pretty controversial thing to say, you know, that, it, that race isn't the main thing. What is the difference exactly, in your mind, uh, between that there are these stereotypes that associate with, with crime and such and that make their way around to a higher likelihood of a presumption of guilt mm -hmm. on the part of a black person. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between that and racism? So I think it's easier to think about in sort of a real world context. So when there's a shooting of a young African-American male, um, I think we get two stories. If you're watching a conservative show, you're told, well, these are inevitable mistakes. It has nothing to do with race, right? There are thousands of police officers out there. Um, when this happens, it's a tragedy, yes, but it's just inevitable in a country as big as the United States. On the left, you hear a story that, well, this must be about racial hatred, right? This must be that this officer disregards black people, doesn't think black people are worth anything, maybe hates black people. Um, and I think that the story from psychology suggests that actually all of us we're overwhelmed by information at any given point. And so we rely on automatic knowledge structures, which just make it possible to be a human being, to interact in the world. Um, and so these shortcuts can often lead to good outcomes. Uh, they can help us, right? I, I can look at you, I can say, okay, he's kind of smiling, he's gonna give me a nice softball question next. Um, <laughs> maybe. Um, those types of cues can be very helpful in planning and in, in seeing what's going to come in our future, but they can also lead us astray. And so certain things over time get connected. One of the things that gets connected is blackness and violence, blackness and crime. Anyone you know, watching the program is familiar with all of the television programs that make that link very, very strong. I have a young daughter. She's already being exposed to this stereotypical association. And so when it comes to something like uh, deciding whether someone's holding a gun or not, we've got to make a split second decision. And what do we rely on? Well, we rely on these automatic connections. Now, that is definitely racial behavior, right? I think to say that this doesn't have anything to race, uh, to do with race is mistaken. It has everything to do with race. The fact that uh, African Americans receive higher bails, the fact that African Americans um, are more likely to be treated uh, brutally by the police, um, that has everything to do with race. It's just the pathway that we get there. It's not that you know judges are um, uh, KKK members looking to um, hurt black people. It's not that um, jurors are looking to convict black people when they would let a white person off. Most of this stuff is happening beyond people's awareness or control and that's what makes it so dangerous is that people end up doing this stuff and thinking that they're absolutely egalitarian, that they would treat a black person exactly the same. Yeah, so you're talking about that you could be called to sit on a jury and, uh, and, and you could be someone who uh, considers yourself very racially egalitarian, you've got uh, a diverse set of friends, uh, and, but you're called to sit on a jury during the void air process, you're asked about racial attitudes and such, and you very honestly say, no, I've, I've, got, no, I've got no biases at all, I'm, I'm totally open-minded here, but that even the person who very genuinely believes that 
uh, is still highly vulnerable to a subconscious response to a, partic- a defendant who looks a particular way. And, and these implicit biases don't just cover race, right? They relate to age. They relate to gender. They relate to how you feel about gay people. Because the same things apply to witnesses, Ab- right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and so I think that uh, when we're, we're looking for solutions, if we just go looking for um, people who have evil in their heart, we're never going to get to the, the, actually the heart of the problem. We have this broad problem or issue in American life that's far beyond the criminal justice system of this paradox that, on the one hand, over the last 50 years, we have, in fact, defeated individual racism in an astonishing way. Yet, at the same time that we've created an environment and a society that that is as good as it is in those fronts, we still seem to have some sort of a giant issue that we can't, that, that leads to Ferguson's and all these other things. One of the interesting things, if you look at the research on implicit bias, is that that <coughs> bias can actually be directed at people of your own race, right? So an African-American person exposed to these damaging stereotypes may devalue black people's lives just like a white person will. And that can help explain, I think, why we have black officers shooting a black suspect, which wouldn't happen necessarily if that was a white suspect. Yeah. You open the book with a, a, a real, just a, a heart-wrenching story uh, that, that unfolds in Washington, D.C. But what, tell us very, very briefly the, the, the gist of, of that account and how it turned mm-hmm. out. So this was a uh, wealthy neighborhood in uh, northwest D.C. And uh, it was a winter night. Guy steps out onto a stoop. He's going to get something um, from the car, and he sees a body lying on the sidewalk. Walks up. The man's actually alive, but he's unable to speak, kind of groaning. So the, the guy says to his wife, "Call 911." A few minutes later, uh, the, the actually it was a fire truck. First pulls around. Fire truck uh, guys start to get out, and almost immediately, the man on the the ground starts to vomit. And one of the firefighters says, "Up, oh, I smell alcohol." on his breath. This is just an ETOH, shorthand for a drunk. And so when the police officers arrive a few minutes later, they kind of keep to the periphery. After all, it's just a drunk, nothing really to see. When the ambulance arrives a little bit time later, the crew leader gets out and she says, what? We came all this way just for a drunk? They kind of throw him in the back. They don't go through their standard protocols. In fact, they're required to take him to the closest hospital. But instead, they go to the one that's a little bit closer to the crew leader's house. She needs to run some errands. When they take him to the, uh, actually to the hospital, he's put in the hallway. Because after all, it's just a drunk. It's a busy night. He's got to sleep it off. Yeah, just sleep it off. And uh, that's how everything goes until one of the nurses walks by. And she notices that the man's breathing in a very strange way. It's this kind of growling snore. So she gives him a sternum rub. And his arms and legs flip inward. Now, that's not a sign of drunkenness. That's a sign of a head injury. And doctor sees this across the way. He rushes over. They push the man into uh, the resuscitation room. They call the trauma team. But ultimately, it's, it's too late. He dies of bleeding in his brain. Now, it turns out this was no drunk. This was David Rosenbaum, a uh, New York Times award-winning reporter, a luminary of Washington. 700 people came to um, this man's um, funeral. What had happened? Well, he'd had dinner with his wife. He'd gotten hiccups, decided to head out for a brisk air cure. Two guys had jumped him, hit him in the back of the head um, with a metal bar, knocked him um, unconscious. And I think what this shows is just how quickly we are to sum people up based on what's directly in front of us. It might be the color of their skin. It might be the fact that they're attractive or unattractive. It might be that they look rich or poor. It might be the way their breath smells. And one of the things that's, that's really just damaging is not just how influential these labels are, but rather how difficult they are to pull off after they've been stuck down on someone's uh, lapel. So we can see in David Rosenbaum's case um, how everything in the case was subsequently filtered through this lens of drunkenness, right? When something didn't fit, say the fact that his back pocket had been ripped out, well, that was kind of put to the side. The fact that he had pinpoint pupils and elevated pulse, that didn't fit either, but it was kind of downplayed. No one followed up on that. Um, And this 
problem of confirmation bias, tunnel vision, is a problem not just for emergency responders, it's also a big issue for judges and jurors and lawyers. In fact, it's a problem for some of the most seemingly objective aspects of our criminal justice system, forensic examiners. So you'd think, you know, matching up uh, a fingerprint or a DNA sample, that would be cut and dry, right? All it is, you just look at the world pattern and does it line up, the computer does it, it's on or off. Um, but that's not actually true. In experiments, when the person who's doing the assessment knows that this particular sample, say, comes from someone who's already confessed or from someone who a witness already picked out uh, of an identification procedure, they're far more likely to find that to be a correct match. And that's really scary, right? A lot of the stuff that we've been relying on for a long time when it comes to forensic analysis is much shakier than the public believes it to be. Again, it's not necessarily a suggestion that, uh, that the fingerprint analyst or the folks down in the crime lab are doctoring their reports at the direction of the prosecutor or the detectives who are involved. It's that since they presume that the detectives have probably gotten the right person and the evidence that's in front of them, if there's any scenario by which it seems to align with the guilt of this person, then that's the scenario they end up with because they just, they, they, this trusted party has already told them what the outcome is gonna be, and so they then find the, the thing that most closely matches that outcome. I think most of the people um, who make these terrible errors are good people with the best of intentions, and they're human. We tend to sum things up very quickly, and then we, instead of just looking at all of the evidence objectively, we selectively go through the evidence looking for stuff that confirms what we already believe to be true. Going back to the very beginnings of, of human evolution, we've made a bargain with certain people in society. We've, we always have needed the big guys to be on the perimeter to, and to help protect the rest of us from whoever the bad guys are. And through all of time, and certainly in present times, uh, we've had this working bargain that you know, the guys on the perimeter are going to have to do some messy things sometimes. But we can rely on them to make defensible choices in the end. And part of our shock as a society right now is we're discovering that how often, I think, those have actually been the wrong choices uh, or how indefensible so many of them are. Yeah, so I think that we, you know, I teach law. Um, and I think my students come in, certainly I came in um, as a law student, um, thinking that our house of law was built on granite, right? That it was so, so solid. And as I, you know, began as a law student, um, as I went out and worked for judge and was a lawyer and then became an academic and then started doing actually experimental collaborations with psychologists, suddenly I realized so much of what we've built our legal system on is sand. It's unsupported myths about human behavior, about what deceit looks like and how people, um, what drives people to commit crimes and how best to deter would-be offenders. And it's worth pointing out that many of those instinctive responses that we have, those implicit biases that we have, are, are oftentimes useful and correct. You know, as you said, the, our gut over, over whether someone is telling the truth or not may be relatively accurate. It may be that 80% of the time we're right, but when you then move into the arena of the, the fate of a person's life or the rest of their lifetime, mm -hmm. that 20% margin of error, if, if that's what we're relying on, uh, then that's a scary thing. Yeah, and some of the things we just feel absolutely certain about, right? If you confess to a rape or a murder, you must have done it. And that's how we treat it in our legal system. We think it's scarcely conceivable that someone could possibly uh, falsely confess to a serious crime. But what we now know is that it's not only possible, I think it's the predictable consequence of using the most widely employed interrogation technique in the United States, the, the Reed approach. And why is that? Well, the Reed approach basically is broken into these two phases. The first approach you brought in to an interrogation. And the first goal of the police officer is just to tell whether you're telling the truth or not. And what do police officers focus on? Well, the same thing that we all focus on. Things like gaze aversion. Are you looking me in the eye? Or are you looking down at your shoes or up at the ceiling? Are your hands shaking? Are your legs bouncing up and down? Once the police officer picks one of these things out and says, yes, this person is lying, well, they move to the second part of the process, which is all about getting a confession. Now, what's the problem with the first part of the process? Well, the things that police officers rely on are not diagnose, good ways to diagnose whether someone's being deceitful or not. 
There are plenty of people who are completely guilty who will look you right in the eye and tell you, nope, I didn't do it. And there are plenty of people, myself included, who get nervous just going through airport security, my hands start to shake. So that's a really bad way to tell whether someone's lying or not. And the problem is, what happens is, we then move to the second part of the uh, interrogation, and that's all about getting to you to say, I did it. My wife, you know, she, she really gets on my nerves, and oh, I can't tell you how many times I've just thought about you know, going after her, and I, you know, I've been there, man. And what happens with this technique is that we know that people find this highly, highly coercive. It's very, very unpleasant, particularly if you've been in an interrogation for a number of hours. And people in this situation tend to think, well, I know I'm innocent. We have this illusion that uh, what's inside of us is very transparent. I know I'm innocent. And if I just say that I did it, I can relieve this acute distress. And you know, soon enough, the detectives, they'll follow up on those other suspects, they'll find other evidence, and I'll get off. And, and if I say I did it, well, at least I can get out of this room and this terrible feeling. And the irony of exactly what you've just described is that implicitly, the subject of this interrogation is in fact acting on their own implicit bias, which is a sense of confidence that the system will work. And so I can get out of this terrible nightmare of a day because tomorrow it'll all be sorted out. Right. But it's not. Right. And a belief that cops, for instance, this is the law after all, they'll be telling me the truth. They won't lie about evidence that they have. What we know, though, from many, many cases, cops routinely lie. They're allowed to lie about stuff. And when you're being told that they have evidence, they've gotten your fingerprint or other things, um, people may admit that they did it and subsequently expect that everything will work out in the end. And the problem is that once you have confessed, please stop looking for anyone else. Indeed, that shaky witness identification of you suddenly seems a lot more firm. So I talk about a man, you know, Juan Rivera, who ends up being accused of raping and murdering an 11-year-old girl. And, you know, if we look at his interrogation, again, this was someone who was young, who had a low IQ, suffering from mental health problems. Um, if we look at the amount of time he spent, right, locked in this room, he too initially denied it. And over time, gave up more and more and more. The actual interrogators became so exhausted, right, they had to go back and bring in other interrogators just to keep going. They brought the initial transcript, right, of this guy's con confession to the prosecutor. The prosecutor looked at it and said, none of this stuff matches up. These are all wrong facts. You need to go back, talk to him some more. And the problem is that oftentimes the people doing these interrogations, they're not trying to set someone up. I really don't think that that's true. I think they're just trying to clarify some matters. They think someone forgot or they're being evasive. And so they say, oh yeah, didn't you mean that she was wearing um, a nightgown and not jeans, right? And the person says, uh, yeah, she was wearing a nightgown, just wanting to give the person what they said, and they change that little detail. And then that is held up later, right, as a sign that this is a valid confession. Look, he said a nightgown, and there was a nightgown at the scene. Only the killer could have known that detail. But where did it come from? It came from the cop. But we have a project here uh, at the Miller Center where we, we ask people about these really seminal issues. Uh, if you were talking to the next president, whoever he or she may be, uh, in January of 2017, mm -hmm. and you had to narrow it down to Here's the one thing you really need to do, Mr. or Mrs. President. Uh, what would that advice be to the next president? It's a great question. Um, the answer that I would give is that we need to embrace evidence-based justice. We have evidence-based medicine for a very long time. Doctors, you'd come in um, to see your doctor and they'd look at you and they'd make a judgment based on their experience, but also their gut, anecdotes that they had heard. And after a point, doctors started to think, well, we're scientists. This is a really bad way to determine whether medicines work, interventions are effective. We should collect data. We should run studies and see what actually is effective and what's ineffective. And so I would say the starting point is to think about, well, what are best practices and to have the courage to change things, to actually think about, well, you know, this may be the best system that the world has ever seen, 
But it's not the system that we as Americans are promised, and we must always strive forward. Well, thank you. You've written a really important book and a, a, a really important uh, set of observations that have got to become part of this conversation. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Adam Binferrato, the book is Unfair, The New Science of Criminal Injustice. We hope you'll join the conversation with American Forum at the Miller Center Facebook page or follow us on Twitter at Douglas Blackman or at American Forum TV. Send us a comment about this program or download podcasts or transcripts. Visit us at millercenter.org American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you.